everyone. I hope you're all having a great hope and I hope that you're staying safe. Uh, I just uh, wanted to share a quick story with you, a personal story about my first DEF CON. My first DEF CON was DEF CON 10. So we have to rewind back to 2002. There are two events that happen in the background, two things to consider in the backdrop for this. The first is at DEF CON 9 when Dmitry Skilarov was arrested by the FBI. Uh, right after his talk. And there was a real fear that at DEF CON 10, something similar was gonna happen. The second big event that happened after DEF CON 9 was 9-11. And let me tell you, that was really scary. And yeah, the, the mood in the, the era was quite tense. So I was going to different talks and I just uh, went to one talk. I can't remember which one it was. And uh, after the talk was winding up and I didn't really have any other plans. So like I sometimes do, I sat and I waited to see what the next speaker was. The next speaker came up and he starts to go into his talk and I listened and I found myself becoming quite enchanted and uh, Im immersed into the talk. And um, we got to the Q&A and questions came up which I found really, really complex and deep. And I, I watched with amazement with how the speaker just sliced through them with ease and agility. And uh, as you probably guessed by now that speaker was Richard Thiem. And I've but I, I've attended many of his talks over the intervening years and every talk I go to, I come away with something new. And I hope that the, uh, I, I hope that that will be true of all of you today. So it is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you today's keynote, Richard Thiem. Thank you, my friend. And I, I appreciate it, aesthetics. Uh, Rachel Meadow says that. Thank you, my friend, and I appreciate it, and I do. Uh, you've been a good, good pal in this crazy wilderness we're wandering for a long time. So um, I will not have any slides. I'm going to talk with you, uh, hopefully not just to you. Um, and I don't have the slides intentionally because they have often functioned like uh, texting and driving. They take 20% of the brain and they compel you to focus on bullet points, which are the most simplistic way of communicating very little. And I don't want to do that. Uh, if you want to write down things, uh, please do. I am available always through the internet, through email, through texting, uh, for any questions you have. Uh, but what I really want you to do is think about this. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the hacker meritocracy and the methodology it has generated over many years in order to provide a, a way of dealing with a new challenge, which is not just the pandemic, but all the consequences of the pandemic, which accelerate some of the things which the hacker meritocracy and organizations like Anon have been trying to combat or EFF uh, for some time. So I want you to think about it and ask whatever questions you might have. Uh, critical thinking is one advantage we have over people who are invincibly ignorant. Uh, and I have learned that life is hard, but it's a lot harder when you're stupid. So the hacker meritocracy is an object lesson in the evolution of a structure that teaches us how not to be stupid, uh, how to take our essential ignorance into a complex, challenging, ambiguous situation and correct for our ignorance. And that methodology is going to be extraordinarily valuable. So hackers already, good hackers, and we'll talk about that. I know how the word has been bastardized and distorted, but you know what I mean by a hacker. I mean what it means. Uh, and the meritocracy is a collaboratory environment, which is uh, adequate to the complexity and ambiguity uh, of what we're facing today. Uh, and there are best practices. There are best ways to do it. And there are not so good ways. Uh, I remember people logging on and saying, teach me how to hack. Uh, that was not a, ver a very good way. Uh, to learn how it worked. Better was to do everything you possibly can to learn and know prior to entering into a tentative conversation with the people who are your seniors and worthy of respect uh, in order to ask a question which clearly demonstrates that you've done everything you know how to do to solve it and then you are treated with respect uh, which you deserve as well and over time are welcomed into the meritocracy and can move on up. So. That was a way of inducing paradigm change. I know that term has been overused, but it's a, a good term that came into currency mostly when Kuhn wrote uh, his book on the structure of scientific revolutions. 
um, and it is uh, easy to misuse it. Uh, and it's easy to discuss paradigm change when you're sitting comfortably in a seminar with a, with a drink. Uh, it's much more difficult to deal with in real life and to experience it. Uh, because we all go through the five stages that you probably know of denial and acceptance, uh, of, from denial to acceptance, including anger and depression and negotiation. And all of those are evident in how people are dealing with the pandemic. Uh, at first, it was denied. Uh, I don't have to repeat all of the statements that were made from on high uh, that it would go away and not it didn't even exist. Uh, and then uh, people uh, got depressed by it and still are, and angry about it. And the anger is misdirected, uh, directed at people who do or do not wear masks, for example. And then you negotiate with it, and then you finally kind of move into acceptance. But I think we're a long way generally from acceptance. Um, these paradigm changes happen the way Hemingway said, bankruptcy happens uh, gradually, and then suddenly. Uh, this one wasn't so gradual by our human standards. Uh, it, it came suddenly and it is overwhelming. And even though a lot of people have been predicting exactly what would happen, the people I knew who worked on terror uh, and bioterror um, couldn't sleep at night because they expected something like this to be generated, created and mandated rather than just happening to happen. Uh, and it's not unprecedented. Pandemics have raged before. The, plague took out a huge percentage of the European population. The Spanish flu has been in the news a lot as people are looking for analogies so they can cope and so we can develop resiliency. Um, and, and things are bad elsewhere. Uh, Syria, on the ground in Syria, it's bad. Uh, in most of America, it's not that bad, but it's, it's still bad, especially for those of us who have gotten used to privilege and prosperity. Uh, and have become comfortable in the new digital world uh, where we have dedicated ourselves to evaluating safety, uh, which now includes not only information systems, but actual viruses, which can be transmitted, not just through a network. Okay, so what have we become? We want to start with some basics, uh, who we really are right now. Uh, a quarter century ago, uh, I've been doing this talking and writing about this kind of stuff for 27 years, just about. And I wrote a column called Islands in the Clickstream, and I coined a phrase, real birds in digital cages. And I said, that is what we had become. Uh, and nothing illustrates that fact more than what you are experiencing right now. Uh, this is a digital cage with its uh, apparent spatial parameters, but in fact, it's a simulation, a simulation you might say of a simulation even. It's never been more true that we are real flesh and blood birds, so to speak, but we are in digital cages. Uh, unless some of you might be bots. If there are any bots, please let me know because I like to know how many bots are in the audience at any given time because their questions are usually different. Uh, but we're looking at and engaging with this digital construction as if it is quote real uh, because it's so familiar we don't see it's bars anymore, uh, which is one reason, as you know, disinformation as well as information is so easy to accelerate today. I also coined the phrase, truth and lies are Siamese twins joined at the lips, because the minute you could tell the truth, that is by developing speaking thousands of years ago, you could lie. Uh, and we know chimpanzees, even without speech, do a pretty good job of deceiving one another when there's enough bananas around that they don't want the others to see. Uh, so disinformation is very easy to accelerate. And we are also collected in groups of like-minded thinkers, which reinforces groupthink and gives a semi-permeable membrane that keeps out other uh, opposing thoughts or questions. And so those who know how to manipulate us through these digital means collect us in cages large enough to create the illusion of the freedom of flight. So we feel as if we're free because we do not see that the large cage is meanwhile being slowly turned until we are facing exactly the right direction, the intended direction to see what others want us to see. And so we feel as if we can flap our wings and fly. But in fact, what Facebook and ads and deep data mining and all the rest are doing, again, as you know, is collecting data, 
parsing it and collecting it in a way that others know more about us than we know about ourselves, which is the fundamental revolutionary movement going on in identity, that who we think we are is not who we are. And those who know who we are on the basis of the patterns of our behavior, because security or identity is a function not uh, of assertion, but of observation. And that's where the hacking mentality comes in. In order to know who someone really is, you have to observe them in action and observe them long enough so that you are not deceived by intentional disinformation in behavior and word, which confuses you. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. I want to address how a context, our context needs to be seen in order to turn it into content onto which you can get your hands, so to speak, a metaphor. I call them cognitive artifacts, but they're like building blocks as new cognitive structures take place in response to the new environment in which we are living. And then when we have them in our hands, we can build shared beliefs and assumptions about the reality we know we experience. Uh, because the future, that is our action now on behalf of an imagined possibility is framed by what we believe and what we believe to be true. So I wanna address some of the many layers of our lives because these contextual systems are nested, uh, fractal-like, self-similar at all levels and society and information security work are the main levels to which I'm going to speak. Now, when I speak of the hacker meritocracy, I speak of a process in which beginners can become experts. Uh, beginners need rules. Beginners don't know what they don't know. And when they're learning something in a new domain, they need rules that are free of context completely. They need black and white binary rules. And they are told, if you ever taught someone or were taught by someone and you were a beginner, they are told, just follow the rules. Just do what I say, follow the rules. Don't break the rules. All right, and you do that long enough to achieve a middle level of expertise or competence uh, somewhere in the middle. You get a level of functionality because you build up your own database of experience. Uh, but if you persist in doing that, you can move into genuine expertise. Now, real experts break the rules all the time, but they know when to break the rules. This made it very difficult when we first began to build expert systems. We thought that with interviews, we could get the heuristics or rules of thumb by which human experts made decisions, and then we could codify them in a whole set of if this, then that, not that set of instructions. And then anybody could become a simulation of an expert by following those branching paths. But what we found out was that real experts uh, break the rules all the time, but they know when to break the rules. So we learned that for real experts, there's just one rule, which is if you don't know when to break the rules, don't break the rules. But if you do, on the basis of contextual understanding of the level of uh, expertise you have achieved, then you break the rules uh, because you don't even know what rules you're following. I remember a nurse, a psychiatric nurse, saying when she first started and she wanted to diagnose whether someone was schizophrenic or not, she had a questionnaire for them. And, uh, and, and they would have to answer all these questions and then she could codify her response. After becoming expert in that, she said, I don't need any questionnaires. I walk into a room, I can smell it. I know if somebody uh, is schizophrenic. I can just tell. Or a boxer who has to think about how to respond to a jab uh, over time doesn't think anymore. Uh, or a martial artist just is present in the moment and responds. So uh, where we're headed, and Anand is an example of this, and I want to get that on the table right away, in my estimation. Uh, Huckleberry Finn, remember Huckleberry Finn? Uh, the novel, uh, at the end of the book, you may remember that Huckleberry Finn and the slave Jim were going down the river. And toward the end of the book, Huckleberry Finn was confronted with the fact that the slave Jim was property, not his friend. 
as he had come to believe, and that he needed to return him to his rightful owner. Now, if he did not, two things would happen. In that Bible Belt zone of Missouri in which Mark Twain was writing, uh, you, you were told by brimstone and fire preachers that you would be damned to hell forever if you didn't do the right thing, which was return a slave to its owner. Uh, and legally, you would go to jail because you were aiding and abetting uh, stolen property uh, not being returned to its rightful owner. And Huck Finn sat there all night under a tree, smoking his corn cob pipe. And in the morning, he said, well, damn it, I'll go to hell then. Damn it, I'll go to hell then. In other words, he was an expert at discerning the real moral level of his quandary, and he leaped to a meta level in which it looked to others who kept the rules, whether religious or legal, as if he was breaking all the rules. But he was in fact accessing a meta level where breaking the former codified rules in fact was a higher level of following the one great rule, which was do the right thing. And that's why I say Anon, or organizations like it, or hacktivism at its heart and at its best, is a way of doing what Huckleberry Finn did. Because sometimes it might look like you are breaking the rules, uh, that you might be damned or go to jail. And sometimes, I don't know about damned, who knows, but you might go to jail or suffer other more indirect consequences for the powers that be. But if you have leaped to that level, it seizes you that acting on that level as if you almost no, have no other choice. You do, you always do, but you act on behalf of that which you know is uh, what you might call the good and the true. Well, while we're talking about rules, in the pandemic, people are trying to follow rules from the past and they don't apply any longer because as society restructures itself to hunker down for the long term with this thing and its economic and social consequences combined with the uproar over other issues, including equality for all of the kinds of dispossessed people that we have gotten away with dispossessing for so long, those rules don't work anymore. You can see this in political discourse. So much of the discussion of political solutions or actions is in 20th century terms and the 20th century is done. We're in the 21st century and we have not yet figured out how to think in terms of the new realities which the 21st century presents and demands that we think. Well, hackers know how to think on the fly. You may be entering a system thinking the system looks one way, the old way, and you soon discover that it doesn't. And that in fact, things that were overlooked or misunderstood or forgotten can be exploited in order to transform your image, your imprint uh, of the system so that you can operate in the system as it actually is. And in so doing, you create by the very nature of the work, a new structure which humplings, humplings do not even see. They don't know. Uh, okay, I use the word humpling. I coined that term in a short story uh, some time ago uh, in which I defined, it was called Break Memory. You can find it in my collection, Mind Games, but you can find it free on my website, in which the masters of society define how they see things. And they defined it as kind of the hump of a bell curve. Uh, a hump, a big hump. And at the front were the masters, 10%. In the hump are the 80%, who I call humplings. And at the tail are the 10% we call dregs. Now the masters keep the dregs so the humplings in the hump will be glad they are not dregs, just like in Brave New World, glad I'm not a gamma, glad I'm not an epsilon. Uh, and therefore we'll do as the masters require in order to stay in the hump. And the whole inchworm kind of moves forward slowly, the masters first building and directing and the humplings inside. Well, all of us are humplings some of the time, but some are humplings all of the time. And you want to be able to understand that the humplings don't know when they are humplings that they are. So uh, this raises really 
challenging questions. Uh, it's not your behavior as a hacker that causes trouble. It's your perceived allegiance. Because the people I have known, and as you know, and some of you are at NSA and CIA and DIA and so on, you are doing exactly the same things. You all know how it works, I think, at a particular level. Uh, we all know people who have been about to reveal a vulnerability and have gotten a call telling them not to reveal it because, for example, uh, that this or that intelligence agency finds it too useful. These days, post-revelation and post-leaking, people know a lot more about that than they did, but some of you have known about that for a long time. The very same tools and techniques used in excellent expert hacking are used in intelligence and counterintelligence. The difference is on whose behalf are you not doing it, because that's a whole other question, but perceived to be doing it. Who owns your soul? You or someone else? And if it is someone else, who is it? So by simply engaging, by simply engaging with the new technologies that are emerging, we become different. We think differently. And when we act differently on behalf of what the technologies themselves teach us, we do things that were literally unthinkable before. Well, where is thinking taking place? We still have the illusion that we are individuals, that is monads, uh, isolated cells of brains. And Marvin Minsky said decades ago, no, 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 no. The thinking is taking place on the network. It is a collective, a collaboratory, a hive mind. And anyone who still thinks only independently without being connected to others in the network, uh, they're a brain in a bottle. They're like a desktop computer on a table disconnected from the network. They are not really capable of being said to be thinking at all because thinking requires the collaboratory, fast feedback, and I'll get to those other hallmarks that make hacking uh, at its most potent, so in engaging. Um, I'm going to skip the next thing with a delightful story, but we'll skip it um, because I'm going back to when I started all this. And truthfully, I saw what was coming back in the 80s. And I start writing about it in the 80s uh, and in the early 90s. And back then I was a clergyman, uh, which I left 27 years ago in order to participate in this revolution which I realized was being ignored and I would have suffocated had I taken the jobs uh, that were being uh, offered to me. Uh, I, I had to get out. And I wrote things about the transformation of experience and the transformation of religious experience coming down the line as a result of the digital revolution I perceived to be taking place. And this was before you understand, before the quote internet, before the word cyberspace uh, leaped out of Neuromancer into common parlance. Uh, I went to an editors and publishers conference of newspaper and magazine publishers and said, you should know what's coming. Uh, you're going to be totally uprooted and, uh, and turned over on your heads. And I was told uniformly, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. We've been in this industry for 40 or 50 years. We know the industry. And I said, that industry is done. It's dead because something new is coming, which is going to transform it. Uh, as it happens, I learned that in those situations, when you are perceiving correctly to be called crazy is a sign of wisdom. Wisdom and insanity are contextual. Uh, and if you say the right thing at the wrong time, you are perceived to be uh, nuts, like poor Samuel Weiss, right? You know, he said, we can eliminate sepsis in surgery, which is killing so many people, if doctors would only wash their hands. But they couldn't think why, because they didn't have a notion of germs when he said it. And the ridicule poured on him for being correct was so intense that he wound up in a mental institution. Uh, he became so angry and so upset by the inability of doctors to learn from what he was trying to tell them and save so many thousands of lives. And paradoxically, he died of sepsis 
in that mental institution after surgery, but nobody could hear him. Nobody could hear what he was saying. Remember what Langdon Winter said, again, many years ago, to invent a new technology requires society to invent the kinds of people who will use it, and all of our new practices, relationships, and identities will supplant the old. In case after case, the move to computerize and digitize means pre-existing cultural forms will go liquid. If I had an ice cube, I would hold it up and you could watch it drip through my fingers. Go liquid, losing their former shape as they are retailored for computerized expression. The new patterns solidify and both useful artifacts, including cognitive Hello. and the texture of human Richard relationships that surround them the will be completely I different from what existed previously. And That's a description of paradigm change. That is a description of what computer technology, primarily now bio and other and nanotech and material science and so on, and space technologies, which is a whole other story I like to address, all of that is going to transform who we think we are, already is, already did. The thing is to wake up and realize that it has already happened. Uh, because what is going to determine how you do in this brave new world, especially if you wield the true weapons of true hackerdom, uh, is your intention. Intentionality matters more than any other thing. Uh, and you have to learn to listen on the edges. Uh, these days, the center of the next truth appears first on the edges and then migrates very, very quickly to be the center of a core system of belief. But every time a new one comes from the edges, it displaces the old center. And we find ourselves in a new way of framing reality. Well, what ideas should you be listening for? I'm gonna to turn to one of my favorite heroes, Robert Galvin. He was the head of Motorola. Back in the day when Motorola was uh, really uh, uh, Motorola uh, before it became uh, what it is today. Um, excuse me, I just clicked on this mistakenly. Um, okay, so Robert Galvin was asked what ideas made the real difference because he had breakthrough ideas that transformed the technologies on which he worked. And he said, what characterized them is if we came into a meeting to discuss a new challenge and everyone immediately agreed on what we should do, it was always wrong. Well, if you think about what I've said about paradigm change and groupthink, it will be clear why. Because if groupthink, if mere thinking, collective thinking, corporate thinking, the way people learn to be assimilated by a culture or corporation and learn to not violate its vision. Because as Timothy Leary said, you never get the truth from a company memo. The higher you go, it's like the invasion of the body snatchers where someone you thought you knew is suddenly speaking corporate speak uh, or culture speak. You were in that paradigm. And if everybody is in that paradigm and agrees right away, and what is required is a new way of thinking about a new challenge, then it has got to be wrong because it doesn't address the challenge that confronts you. So you, you need to listen to people on the edges. Uh, and it takes a, a long time to get there. All breakthrough ideas, he said, began as the opinion of one or a couple of people. And the others in the room could not hear it. They couldn't hear it because they couldn't believe it. Uh, and so they laughed at it. They just laughed because it was funny to hear something so different from what people thought, uh, which is, as I said, the way I was greeted when I start writing about the computer revolution in the 80s and 90s. People laughed literally at what I said and said, that's insane. That's crazy. Um, God forbid was one comment in an article I wrote. Uh, but it's all, all become true. All breakthrough ideas begin that way. It doesn't mean every idea that people laugh at is a breakthrough idea, but the obverse is true. All breakthrough ideas are often, uh, or often most are laughed at. I mentioned Samwise. Um, he said, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, because it was an opinion of one, it had to be introduced carefully and strategically in order to seize the imagination 
and be translated into action in a group. So uh, he created a technology roadmap for Motorola. And he said, one thing we encouraged was that there would be a more than adequate number of minority reports. He said, once we elected to support was on the roadmap, made a decision about what to go ahead and do, we would go back and say, who didn't we hear? Who had an idea that we missed because we couldn't hear it or dismissed it out of hand? Who got lost in the noise from being identified? He said that gave us another iteration. Since maybe we had been too short-sighted, we had to see to it that all the influential people had a firm voice in what we ought to be doing. And we kept encouraging them to look for more and letting them know that we could support them when their point of view seemed to be at odds with the majority or dominant or well-assimilated cultural point of view. Um, one of our senior people, he said, uh, who was an engineer said, you know, we're lucky we had you as the head man of this company for decades because you weren't an engineer. If you were an engineer, you'd probably have known the reasons why we were pretty sure we couldn't do what was being tossed out as a speculative notion. You kept believing that we could do it and then we would have to go off and try to do it and we would discover we could do it. Important point because it points to the need of cross-disciplinary thinking. It points to the fact that any discipline or domain of expertise, including hacking or engineering or computer science or information security or call it what you will, is both limiting as well as inclusive. The better you get at it, the harder it is to see the kinds of insights that come from outside. When a woman became president of MIT, I think about 15 years ago, first woman, first woman, first president of MIT, not to have a background in engineering. Her background was biology. And you probably know that Bill Gates said if he was studying over today, he wouldn't be in computing, which is a mature industry, he would be in bi biology. One of her first addresses was the necessity of the student body grasping that the only way to learn for a lifetime was to become adept in cross-disciplinary learning and to have to develop the resilience and the toleration of ambiguity and even discomfort to go into domains that you know you don't understand or know well in order to learn from them. And when you see the results of that cross-disciplinary learning, for example, Bucky Fuller developing a geodesic dome by looking at the eye of a housefly uh, and other examples in which bingo, the creative light goes on because two things juxtaposed as in a successful metaphor uh, show you a new way of thinking about something, then, then you are capable of being educated, not by someone else, but by your own experience. And you are capable of participating in lifelong learning. So engineers are great, but um, I do, um, Remember, I was doing a talk on, uh, actually it was on UFO phenomena. I do several talks on that because I've explored it for, what, 40 years. And that's a whole other subject, but I was uh, taking it seriously enough because the data was so solid to be invited to address the astronomers in a suburb of uh, Chicago. And I always like to check who's in the audience when I'm gonna be doing a speech. Like I kind of have a clue as to who might be out there uh, and imagining those of you to whom I am speaking. And I asked the guy who invited me to speak, uh, what kind of audience is it? And he said, well, they're, they work at Abbott Labs and Motorola and Baxter Labs. And I said, oh, so, the, so it's educated then. And he paused and he said, well, yeah, uh, but they're engineers. Now that was his joke, not mine. And he wasn't kidding really. What he was saying is that to be trained as an engineer or to be trained in computer science, is to learn a way of thinking which is terribly good and absolutely applicable in all sorts of situations, but it's not all there is. And therefore a different structure of thinking, it's like Goethe, the German poet and writer saying, anyone who speaks one language speaks no language. Because once you start learning a second language, you discover that your very framework, your way of perceiving and articulating the world uh, is determined by your language. So uh, 
you have to remember to be open, as George Bernard said, to heresy. All great truths, he said, begin as blasphemy and build in an openness to heresy because today's heresy is tomorrow's orthodoxy. Let me give you another example. I was doing a talk for uh, FBI, actually, and I was talking about how, as you all know by now, but then it was new, boundaries were going down around nation states. And therefore, the real sources of power and influence on us, on our behavior, were coming from a different source. That's a good example of how we didn't have the language to think beyond nations or countries then. We invented words like trans, uh, transnationals, and all that's like driverless car. It's not a car if it's driverless. A uh, horseless carriage, uh, for example, drop the horseless. Uh, you have to invent new language for these new realities so that we can uh, talk about them. And I was doing a talk for the FBI and talking about how their mission had changed, not because they got an executive order, but de facto by circumstances that compelled them to go abroad. In other words, you couldn't do the work of the FBI anymore without going into other countries. But the FBI was a police organization established in this country to work within its borders. And the CIA, on the other hand, was an intelligence organization empowered and instructed to break the laws of every country except this one, uh, but not to operate in this country. And now, of course, as you know, it often operates in this country and that slippery slope uh, beginning after 9-11 in spades meant that the laws of this country are broken uh, and then forgiveness, not permission, is usually granted. That's a whole other conversation. Uh, so I was saying that that had happened and the uh, FBI guy in charge in the Chicago office, he said, bingo, he said, that explains what I'm running into. I said, what are you running into? He said, we used to be able to count on patriotism to mobilize people to be glad to work with us and work with us as a result. But more and more, he said, what I'm hearing people say is, we would sure like to help you, but, well, that but is the key to the kingdom. The but means the sources of their own behavior and the power and influence directing it or inflecting it is not what it was because the organizational structures are transnational. I had a friend who went to Davos not long ago and she came back shaking her head. She said, do you know, I didn't have a conversation with a single person who had any sense of obligation to a country. They have built their own ad hoc alternative structures to the world in which the humplings live. And they have built legal enclaves and offshore enclaves and a way of doing life, not just work, but life that most people don't understand or know about, but it is shorn of the allegiance they might've had once to whatever nation they thought patriotically inspired their behavior. And that's because the real results of what they do are not determined by their country any longer. They're determined by actors all over the world with whom they collaborate and work. Well, the hacker meritocracy is just a mirror image, a darker mirror image of that. Because without structure, without boundaries around identity to determine on whose behalf we act, we can't know not only who we are, but what are the consequences of what we're doing. So many things become a false flag operation in life, as well as in work and espionage. So current technologies make even speaking of interception obsolete because our technologies constitute the physical framework uh, of, of the whole informational context in which we live, of a pan-global society. And so the boundaries are arbitrary and porous and as often as not used, as I said, in 20th century political discourse ways to speak to people where they think they live, but where they do not live any longer. We do literally live in a world without walls and foreign and domestic have ceased to have meaning or the meaning they used to have 
here and there are distinctions in the informational world without a difference. So I wrote this, I'm gonna read something I wrote because I like to quote me, because uh, I say, oh, you, you, you were smart. Uh, information security as one task, both offensive and defensive in the intelligence community, sanctions breaking foreign laws while prohibiting similar activities on American soil. But simple distinctions of foreign and domestic don't hold. The convergence of enabling technologies of intrusion, interception, and panoptic reach, combined with a sense of urgency about the counterterror imperative and a clear mandate from leadership to do everything possible to defeat an amorphous non-state entity defined by behaviors rather than boundaries, borders, or even a clear ideological allegiance has created an ominous but invisible set of conditions that undermine the previous cornerstones of law, ethics, international law, and even our religious traditions. So really there's only one threat, the insider threat, because no one is outside. Everyone is inside some configuration of the network. However, you build the image of the network in your mind and mount it into your brain, uh, everyone's an insider. So there's no outside threat ultimately because there's nothing but, as you know, bays and inlets and coves along the endless coastline of life today. So how do we live with this? How do we cope with this? Well, we need three things. I coined this mantra some time ago, and I haven't seen a good reason for getting rid of it yet. We need mutuality. The hacker meritocracy gives you that. You can't do it alone. You need to work with others. You need feedback. And the complexity of the systems determines how frequently and how much feedback we need going into and out of the system. And we need to be accountable on clear goals and intentions. And, um, and aesthetics is back on screen and he's doing this with his finger, which either means there's a fly in the room or he wants me to uh, wind up. But there's more to say about that. I've written a lot about it, mutuality, feedback, accountability. Check my website. A lot of it is free, all of it is free, email or text. Any questions that come up subsequently that you wanna discuss, I'm always out of, out of time before I'm out of words. Uh, just be in touch. Thank you so, so much. Uh, for the privilege of being a participant in this extraordinary event. Q and A. Uh, looks, oh, apparently you have another six to eight minutes if you would like it. Oh, well, hell. You Although there that? is a question. Would you like the question or do you want to continue? It's up well, to you. Well, sure. Give me the question. Okay, there's a question coming from Vortex Egg. So is the next stage learning to hack collective belief systems at scale? Is this what is happening with the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica or internet research agency, et cetera, pushing conspiracy theories and alternate realities? And how do we counter this and help people survive? Uh, great question. Uh, it, you're putting your finger uh, on exactly the existential dilemma we all face. And uh, I, I feel like it's a, uh, a, a retreating, we're firing it over our shoulders as we're retreating from the reality that you described. Uh, it has become the norm for anybody with appropriate resources, money, and intention to build those kind of systems and create belief systems. Uh, you know how people, I said digital uh, birds in digital cages, you know how people are being collected into thoughtless aggregations, which are reinforced by repetition. And even professors at good schools tell me they have students who cannot distinguish between the popularity of an idea and its accuracy because repetition of it through social media has given a currency in their brains. And a conspiracy theory is a conspiracy theorist is a term often applied to me uh, by people who want to disparage and ridicule what I'm saying. But as I said, my track record bears out that I've been right about the big issues. Um, and so it's not a conspiracy for people to decide what to do, look at their resources, go into a room, plan, execute, come out, do it. Um, that's not a conspiracy. That's how people operate. And the political groundswell of favoring these kinds of lies, disinformation, and uh, destruction 
of the very possibility of civil discourse require a pushback. And this is where, when I say Anon, I'm really not kidding, but l let me tell you a cautionary tale. Gary Webb was a friend of mine. He wrote this incredible series on crack cocaine, the CIA and the Contras, and he was destroyed for writing it more accurately than not, uh, and deprived of his career, which was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And I called him one night when I was following something that was scaring me. I was high anxiety and I said, Gary, you lost your career by telling the truth. Was it worth it? And he gave me an impassioned, idealistic speech. If we don't do this, Richard, then they win. We have to do this. Uh, because I know who I was up against, he said. They lie, they, they destroy reputations, they kill people for a living with impunity. Uh, but we have to do it to tell the truth. Well, they so undermined his ability to function that he wound up killing himself. And his words echo in my mind in the light of that event. It wasn't a CIA plot to kill him. You don't have to kill someone if you take away their motive, power, and reason for living, which is the most effective way of undermining somebody. And the fact that 10 years later, the CIA admitted that some of which they had said couldn't possibly be true was true because a distance in time uh, means no accountability. Uh, people just wait it out and then acknowledge, well, yeah, we did that. And I can give you a million examples of how it's happening all over the political landscape. We have no choice but to learn how to find and trust partners worthy of collaboration on behalf of shared values to protest what will otherwise become the inevitable capturing of all of us as in Hungary, as in Poland, as in Russia, and I dare say, as some would have here, uh, in, in order to eliminate civil discourse, critical thinking, and meaningful addressing of reality itself, facts, uh, we have to call it out whenever we see it, and we have to undermine it whenever we can. And if you know a better way to do it than Anon, uh, you write to me and let me know. There's another question that I think that you would really like. What is your take on all the public UFO footage being released? Is the government stretched so thin that nobody is monitoring this or is everyone so apathetic and thus compliant that they can just dump this footage and not worry? Uh, well, you know, as I said, I've, I've dealt with that for 40 years ever since I said I was a clergyman and a, a major a fighter pilot, heavily decorated, told me alone in the church basement I was his clergyman. He said, we chase them and we can't catch them. So I said, oh, you mean this is real? This shit is real? He said, oh, it's real, all right. So I've spent 40 years, again, in the template I raised, trying to escalate my game to engage with the best and the brightest in a field full of disinformation. And the result was a book in which I collaborated and to which I contributed called UFOs and Government, a Historical Inquiry, which documents how the governments, several, responded to UFO phenomena from the 40s to the 80s in light of genuine national security concerns. So this is a very big question, a big issue. Those particular videos, those particular events, which have come out of the Navy this time, the Tic Tac videos and the like, we've known about those for a long, long time. You, unless you're there, you don't know if it's an intentional disclosure or an accidental disclosure, but there are people and there has been a to and fro inside various agencies, it's not just one, it's all of them, about what do we say about what we know and what we show in our book and others have shown demonstrably, we have known from the beginning. Uh, we didn't need Aunt Tilly to say she saw a lighted object come down behind the barn and scare her cattle to death because we knew. We had radar, we had sensors, we've been monitoring this. I've talked to people, NORAD, DIA, CIA, NSA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that you know doesn't mean anything if what you can do is be ignored. I've given over 50 talks on that book, including astronomical societies and the FBI. And people say, well, how does the government respond? And my response is to stand in silence until they get the quite, uh, quasi joke. It's just ignore it. Don't even counter it. Let it go away. Or if necessary, flood the airways with disinformation and confusion. It requires the things I've been saying. 
mutuality, feedback, and accountability with the very best minds looking at the real facts and data of that subject for decades. And that's what we've tried to do. Uh, but I can address those questions more specifically offline. Thank you so much for uh, your keynote, Richard. Uh, yeah, on behalf of Hope, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. What a great group, huh?